All right. Welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us today. We're gonna to give everybody about a minute to get logged on and then we'll go ahead and get started. If you'd like to um, go ahead and put in the chat where you're from, what your name is, we'd love to, um, to hear where everybody is, is coming from today. Hey, Lindsay. Wow, we've got people from all over the country. Love to see it. All righty. Well, well, we're going to go ahead and get started. Thank you, everybody, for joining us today and being a part of our Wednesday afternoon. We're really excited for our second webinar of our Collegiate Recovery Leadership Academy student webinar series. For anyone who is not part of our Collegiate Recovery Leadership Academy or is unfamiliar with Safe Project, I would um, really encourage you to go ahead and take a look at our Safe Project website. We are doing a lot um, at the national level to combat the addiction crisis in our country right now. Um, so much that it would be too, way too much to share in this brief introduction. Uh, but today we are here on behalf of our Safe Campuses Initiative. And our Safe Campuses Initiative, our mission is to um, normalize recovery on campuses across the country. So we really want campuses to be supportive of their students in recovery. And we do that through a variety of ways. And one of those is supporting students in recovery through our Collegiate Recovery Leadership Academy Fellowship Program. So welcome to our CRLA students. We're so happy that you're here. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and pass it over to Kim, uh, to Matt, who is our student voice liaison. He is a student employee who went through the Leadership Academy last year and is gonna be a big part of this webinar. Um, and then we'll continue on with introductions from there. I didn't know which Matt you were talking about. I'm sorry. <laughs> Uh, I'm Matt. I'm student voice liaison. Like Hannah said, I went through the cohort last year, so I'm just here for any questions you have. You can always reach out to me. Um, anything you need to know about the program or if you had any, um, any questions about your impact projects or anything like that, just don't be afraid to reach out to me. Thank you. And here's Kim, Dr. Kim. Hi, yeah, so uh, my name is Kimberly Bolden. I am the Senior Director for Safe Campuses here at Safe Project. Um, and it is my pleasure to introduce to you today, um, Matt Axelson. Um, oh, sorry, we stopped sharing. Uh, so, so Matt is a Disability Services Advisor at Capella University and an alum from Augsburg University. Um, at Capella, Matt was a member of the CEO's Council on Diversity, Equity, Inclusion. Um, he leads the Council Subcommittee on Disability and Accessibility. Um, I know when I worked with Matt in the past um, that he has been really in, instrumental in pushing me to get more involved and try to get me into the Seller Speakers Club, the Toastmasters International Club. And I know that Matt is um, very active in improv. So I'd say he is an expert in the art and science of convincing others to uh, to move to action and I'm really excited to learn from him today about how we can all sort of carry that in our work moving forward. So with that I will turn it over to Matt who we're really proud to have here today. Very cool. Well thanks Kim. It's great to see you and uh, I guess other Matt as we say Matt and other Matt is just how it works for anyone born mid 80s to mid 90s I think. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen here and then we'll see if all this works out just fine. All right, are you able to see an awkward screen of a Teletubby looking over a mountain range? Perfect. All right, so uh, again, thanks everyone for attending today. Uh, I'm very excited to be able to chat with you and if I'm in uh, gonna be full, Honest and vulnerability mode, a little bit nervous, a little, uh, a little anxious, but that could also just be all the coffee coursing through my veins. Uh, so the title of the webinar today here is The Art of Persuasion, How to Effectively Communicate Your Ideas. Uh, we see here on the first screen an image containing 
a background of snowy mountains with a clumsily added image of a sun baby from Teletubbies awkwardly smirkily looking over the mountain range. Uh, I am known at my work for my uh, sweet, sweet Microsoft paint skills. So I decided to put them at uh, work for you all here. Uh, as Kim said, uh, my name is Matt Axelson. I use he or they pronouns. Uh, I'm a white guy here from Minnesota, St. Paul representing here. Uh, brown hair, clear glasses, wearing a plaid shirt, classically Minnesotan. Um, and as you uh, mentioned, as Kim had mentioned, uh, I'm, yeah, a disabled guy. I have spina bifida. I don't actually don't know if she mentioned that part, but I have history and experience with Toastmasters and specifically our club here in the Twin Cities called Stellar Speakers. Uh, improviser across the Twin Cities here and online, which we started over the pandemic, uh, getting to know people from across the country and around the world, which has been awesome. Uh, been an academic and disability services advisor at Capella University. Uh, like I said before, white Minnesotan, uh, access consultant, diversity, ed, uh, equity, and inclusion advocate. Um, I've also been married uh, 12 years, which in and of itself I've heard is a bit of a feat. Uh, and uh, my partner is a chemical dependency and mental health therapist. Uh, so we've got some uh, crossover experience here as well. Uh, I'm an Augie, as <laughs> was mentioned. Uh, an alum of Augsburg University uh, graduating class of 2013. Uh, and uh, I have here <laughs> listed uh, visionary with an asterisk because I know that that uh, sounds grandiose, uh, but specifically I'm pulling that from uh, Adobe Creates Creative Types uh, that they had recently, uh, I believe recently put out there. And of the visionary type, it says that you live in a world of infinite possibilities, preferring to see things not as they are, but as they could be. Uh, you know that life is limited only by the boundaries of your own beliefs and you're driven to push the limits of, well, everything. Uh, and that's, uh, that's me. <laughs> that's what I strive for and what I, I like to do because I like to uh, imagine. I like to think of what the wor world could be and never rely on the excuse that we are where we are and we will continue to be there because that's the way it's always been. That's not good enough for me. Uh, I guess if you're into these things, also an ENFP, an Enneagram type, nine, uh, Hufflepuff, Libra, et cetera. Uh, I put it here that my mom's name is Carla, which I uh, just you know, put in there because C-R-L-A, Carla, Carla. Yeah, thought that would be a little funny. But also uh, she wonderfully went to treatment twice when I was a child uh, for substance use. Um, and honestly, I think those were two of the best decisions that she's ever made. Uh, yeah, I know those were hard decisions for her, uh, but they led to a beautiful life for her kids and being able to, to move forward and have uh, empathy and understanding of the challenges that come along with that. So that's just a little bit about me uh, or a lot about me, I guess, depending on what you're looking for. And uh, yeah, I just wanted to uh, let you know where I'm coming from in all of uh, what I'm about to present to you. So again, we're here to talk about the art of persuasion. Uh, and from my Toastmasters experience, what they say is that the ability to persuade people or getting them to understand, accept, and act upon your ideas is a valuable skill. Your listeners will more likely be persuaded if they perceive you as credible. Hopefully some of those points earlier led to that. And if you use logic and emotion in your appeal and appeal to their interests, that's also contributing to the ability to persuade. And it typically takes practice unless you're Tom Hanks, who is just wonderfully charming uh, in all times and ways. Although he probably had some practice in there too, I'd assume. Um, but what we'll address today, the problem why is it so hard to verbalize our ideas to those who have decision-making power? I think first, just acknowledging that that is the case, it can be uncomfortable, um, and then what to do with that. So I'll have some tangible ways to improve communication and public speaking skills. Uh, we'll discuss the value of staying authentic and uh, remaining confident in our ideas, even when our message isn't well-received. Again, via Toastmasters and some of this experience, uh, they like to say Toastmasters International, that people who can speak persuasively 
have a great deal of influence. The ability to get others to understand, accept, and act upon your ideas is a skill you can use every day at home, which a lot of us are at right now, or at work. And sometimes those are the same places or even in our community. It is also a characteristic of a good leader. Throughout history, people have rallied around those who can speak persuasively, for better or worse. Uh, so there are three different types of persuasion that they outline. Uh, those being to inspire, to convince, and call to act or call to action. Uh, if you're aiming to inspire someone, your goal is to excite your listeners about your topic or reinforce their existing ideas or beliefs, not necessarily to alter their opinions or beliefs. Uh, an example here, uh, we can think of commencement addresses. As a student, as a learner, your money has already been spent. You put the work in getting that degree, and now you just want people to recognize their efforts and feel good hopefully about their investment in themselves uh, and for the community. So uh, preaching to the choir a bit, right? Another contextual example here might be going to uh, an AA meeting and sharing about staying sober through a tempting situation uh, or at a site for needle exchanges and sharing about how not having had to deal with an infection for a long time has been major positive <laughs> in your life or chatting with a friend about how stress a stressful midterm didn't cause you to fall back in old patterns. Those are examples of being able to inspire someone. Uh, to convince someone, you really want your listeners to change their opinions or to develop, to, de sorry, to develop the same opinion that you have. You may not want them to do anything at the moment other than changing their minds. An example of this could be a presentation convincing listeners that extra old extraterrestrial life exists. <laughs> there may not be much to do with that information immediately, but uh, you want more people on your side for any number of reasons. Or another example here, to be helping uh, people understand the folks in recovery are actually capable of talking about other things than just their recovery, even though that may still be a fairly frequent topic of conversation. Uh, and the last one here, and I think this is where I am today. And when I say I think, actually, I know this is what I'm here for today is to call to act or to call to action, where you want listeners to do something after hearing your presentation. Uh, example, again, could be today's webinar, uh, could be signing a petition, reading a book, buying a product, uh, or hey, maybe trying to get your campus to increase funding for substance free housing on campus, setting up recovery groups on campus. Etc. As mentioned at the pro or at the beginning, though, there's a bit of a problem in the way, right? And sometimes that is just our minds uh, going there. But the question is, why is it so hard to verbalize our ideas to those who have decision-making power? Admittedly, changing people's minds is difficult. Period. <laughs> Your listeners. I uh, think they already have a rational view of your subject, whatever that view may be. It might be wrong. Uh, even if you just raise a topic, some people will nod and grin their way through it. But your task is to provide the proof that they need to change their minds. You must arouse their interest, the listener's interest, help them to assimilate that new information into their existing knowledge, and then guide them into forming new beliefs. So again, you're getting interest, giving them that new information and helping them form that into what they would uh, perceive, believe, and do. The more that you can help provide in the process, the more successful you'll be in persuading your listeners. It's bold and too often rare thing for people to admit that they don't have much knowledge on a topic. So generally, you're going to be working with folks who think maybe they know a bit more than they do. So be careful, be gentle. Uh, the implications here that we don't always know uh, what they want or the parameters in which they're having to make their decisions. Uh, there's also the unknown of how this may impact our prospects or opportunities with them. Uh, so this again is talking about uh, when we're trying to uh, verbalize, verbalize our ideas to those who have decision-making power, right? They may have any number of things going on at a given time, and we don't know what that background is in their life or their decision-making process when we're presenting these things to them. 
Unfortunately, too, as Sarah Ahmed has commented, when you expose a problem, you pose a problem. And some people don't like that. What I'm getting at here is that if you mention there's a lack of funding in a certain area, people may say, wait, why are you talking about this? This isn't actually a problem. Who actually needs this? Uh, it can make us feel uncomfortable, right? And additionally, asking anything makes us feel vulnerable and it allows others to confirm some of our worst fears. Not that they will, but they could say that uh, and confirm that they don't actually care about something that's very important to us. And that's hard to hear. Uh, we have a lifetime of learning that's gotten us to the point where we're at. And it's not always been easy learning. So for people to deny that or to uh, dis excuse me, discount it is uh, it's a hard thing to go through. Uh, yeah. But here's some tips, right? In, uh, before going into those situations, uh, because I think when we can get ahead of it, it can make that time a bit easier, a little smoother. So if we can practice vulnerability, uh, that be that with friends, colleagues, uh, to be able to enter into that space of confidence. Uh, you know, it's much easier said than done, uh, but it allows us to uh, receive critique at times and to be able to not just dig our heels in and be defensive. Um, one tip that was provided to me by my uh, mentor in Toastmasters, uh, and I've since actually heard from a few other people, uh, is to enter any space believing that the people there want to hear from you. Uh, that's hard for me sometimes because I feel like I'm a bit of a squeaky wheel or especially as a person with a disability, if I'm talking about things regarding disability, then, oh, I'm just that disability guy. Oh, Matt's around, he's gonna talk about disability stuff. Uh, but a lot of times people are wanting to learn. Uh, and so it, you know, as it may not be the case, it can help personally sometimes just to believe that the people want to hear from you. Apparently my dog back here thinks that we wanna hear from her. And while she is cute, and she just wants me to go check the mail, which I will do later. <laughs> uh, so uh, another tip for entering the space is to be grounded and knowledgeable in what you're sharing. Uh, winging it can be easier sometimes, or it can feel easier, and sometimes that can just raise even more anxiety. Uh, but being able to be grounded and knowledgeable will help that, especially when people present questions. So we'll see at the end of this how well I do <laughs> for the Q&A that... Uh, you may have as well here. Um, centering your experience will give it much more weight and it becomes more difficult for folks to discount what you're saying. Bring on the anecdotes. Uh, I don't know how many times uh, during Toastmasters presentations, uh, speeches, anything that someone gave, they're going on about data, they're going on about facts and all this is really important. But as soon as they say, well, and in my experience, or let me tell you about something that happened the other day, attention just rose immediately. And then people were in it, they were focused, they wanted to hear what that person said. Uh, we want to balance that. So it's not just, hey, listen to me talk about me, uh, but the anecdotes help. And people are much more willing to listen when they know that this isn't just some ethereal, vague concept, but something that has a human face attached to it. Uh, Again, in COVID times, it's a little difficult some, uh, to, to get in front of people uh, in a way that uh, presents your humanity. But I, I'm so thankful for technology these days, even for uh, the opportunity to be able to speak with you. <laughs> uh, hopefully this is presenting again, a human face to these things. It's not just a book telling you that you should go ahead and be persuasive and hear some great things. This is a person myself who has uh, lived this, who's benefited from it. Uh, and I'm continually using it. Uh, so how do we do this? Here are some tangible options for you. I've got a few images here of a plain body, digitally in <laughs> created, standing in front of a podium, uh, a symbol, uh, the logo for Toastmasters International, and a couple people sitting in chairs, which we'll get to. As I said, sure, uh, confidence sounds great, but what are some of the actual ways to gain experience and knowledge and practice to be able to grow in that confidence? Uh, well, uh, one option, and I'll go through five here that are listed on the screen. Uh, one could be going
going to Toastmasters or a different campus organization that's based uh, around this. Uh, so depending on the area, campus availability, uh, there may be opportunities for things like debate, mock trial, open mic nights, uh, ways to just present something you care about and to gain some confidence being in front of people. Uh, I know some people who've even taken the opportunity now during uh, this pandemic to uh, engage publicly with people in their, the comfort of their own homes like I'm doing right now, just to be able to get over uh, some of the nerves that uh, frequently do come along with that. Uh, a lot of times there are also classes for public speaking or persuasive communication. Uh, so this could be at uh, the college or the university you're attending uh, or community college that's adjacent to that. Uh, and sometimes it's even online. Again, one of the benefits to actually come from this pandemic. Um, you could, uh, as a third option here, gather a group for practice and critique. So uh, in Toastmasters, one of the things that we would do, we would have timed speeches. And when we were doing that, you have someone who's there to help time you and let you know when you're running out of time. So if that ends up happening, someone can, you know, like mad maybe or can <laughs> let me know. Uh, but uh, there are also opportunities. There's someone there who's an ah counter or grammarian who's counting your ahs, ums, your default words, and uh, will give you some guidance at the end of it, right? But it requires that you be receptive to feedback. And that is, again, an act of vulnerability and sometimes a challenging thing to do. You don't like hearing those things about, oh, this was a word, but I didn't realize until I was in Toastmasters that some of my default words were even part of my vocabulary, that I would say even a lot, or that I would say like a lot, which is obviously one for people. But how frequent I would do that was unbeknownst to me until someone called it out, but I had to be willing to put myself in that space. So if, even if you don't have a Toastmasters group or another one that's already set up, sometimes just gathering a few people or putting something out on a board saying, hey, would anyone be interested in this and allowing yourselves uh, to enter that space together could be helpful. A fourth option could be seeking out a mentor with the desired uh, skill uh, or knowledge that you are looking for. Uh, maybe you've just seen a powerful presentation and I'm not gonna say mine, uh, but maybe another one. Uh, feel free to seek that person out uh, or their contact info. See if they might give you some guidance or tips or tricks uh, that got them to that point. Uh, this is actually something I gauged in yesterday uh, where something came about. It's a project that I'm working on and trying to get over the hill here, uh, or over that little threshold. And another one came up where someone seemed to have success in getting something similar. And now I want to connect with them to be, uh, or to learn from them and see how I can get my project in that space. And the fifth one, which might seem a little odd or bizarre to you is to give improv a try. Uh, that's uh, symbolized on the slide here by the two people sitting in chairs. A uh, little bit more on this. So uh, what does yes and have to do with it? Um, well, we want people to hear what we have to say, but often the first step in that is listening for what they want, what they know already, uh, or what they're claiming. And it can be helpful to use their own words, to cite their stories, uh, and improv can help with these skills. You may have heard of and even heard of mockingly in a lot of shows uh, about the classic yes and structure. To break that down, uh, what that essentially means is the yes, is that you are listening to what the other person is bringing to the collaboration to understand their needs and concerns. Uh, you are affirming that. The yes is just accepting that what they've given you is what you have to work with. The and is here, like this is where you address those points, not by negating or getting defensive, uh, but by working what's all or with what's already been given and made known. Uh, and then uh, the and and what follows is the collaborative piece of it. And it's, it's not manipulation or coercion, but it's getting buy-in from partners. Uh, and in improv, sometimes an audience 
to be able to move any piece of work forward, whether that be artistic, whether that be something that you're seeking. Uh, the yes and philosophy is really helpful because there's nothing worse than being on a scene and or being in a scene or even watching a scene of someone performing. You have no idea what's going on because two people seem to have very different ideas of what that is. We want to be able to collaborate together and to be able to bring those things and build a world and build uh, maybe some hilarities, maybe sometimes just having that opportunity to see humanity in front of you, uh, but you have to be there. So uh, you also have to be authentic with it, which uh, seems a little strange, right? Uh, improv, from a lot of people's understanding or improvisational acting, uh, seems like it trains you to be someone or something else, maybe a lamp in a background, who knows, but uh, you know, so it can cause us to wonder how uh, does this factor into the value of staying authentic? Well, it's anecdote time. And on the screen here, uh, I've got just the words on a uh, strange mirrored background, uh, no occasion, uh, saying theft by swindle. It is, or it's a real charge. What I mean by that is, uh, so my grandma, uh, whom we refer to uh, affectionately, I don't know, in my family as jail grandma, uh, is named such because she was in jail in the early 90s for what we later, or what we thought was embezzlement and later found out uh, was a charge called theft by swindle, which sounds so very old timey. Like I should be having some ragtime music playing behind me or uh, who knows what. But she had a license for life insurance and let it expire, uh, yet continued to collect monies. Um, Interestingly enough, as shown by her rival grandma, my cousin's grandma, uh, was she was later quoted in the local paper as saying, if I go down, I'm taking you with me, uh, which is such a classic movie line. And I have to imagine that that came about far before she said it, uh, but legit. She was uh, quoted in the paper along with her address and phone number because that's how they did that in the, at that time. Uh, because she was found out, she wasn't being authentic. She chose an easy way out uh, with short-term gains and long-term fallout. Uh, our family had had uh, an, a cabin on a lake, um, but that was paid for by the, this money, right? It was tainted. Uh, from that, uh, after everything fell out, a, Family moved across the country, went to Alaska, Colorado, Florida, Missouri, even just elsewhere in Minnesota, and for some folks, treatment, uh, because there was a lot of things that just had to be dealt with. This was an extremely stressful situation, uh, and that is actually after, or when my mom went to treatment as well, um, and I went into foster care. It's not an easy thing for uh, a, a decision to make, but again, it was one of the best that uh, that she did make. Um, and, you know, I know it's not at all relatable and certainly nothing similar to anything that the rest of us have done, making short-term uh, choices with long-term follow-ups or anything like that. Uh, but the authenticity there uh, is, is really what got her into trouble. She wasn't being honest about what, uh, where she was and what she was doing with uh, those people's money including her own mother, uh, who was unfortunately the largest victim of the whole operation. So now uh, let's yeah dig a little deeper here to, into the value of authenticity. And I'm not sure if uh, folks here, depending on age, who knows, uh, would recognize uh, the gentleman in the photo on this slide, uh, but that is the great MC Hammer uh, in his parachute pants sparkly and an illustration behind him of uh, other people seemingly possibly just white people wearing parachute pants uh, i don't know that i ever did that but it was uh, it was a choice <laughs> what i want to talk about what's the value of authenticity is that there for me there's nothing that causes me to tune out more uh, to what someone is saying faster than when it feels like that person is fake 
And I'm hoping that that's not at all what I'm presenting here. Uh, in, if you're in the Twin Cities at all, you may have seen some billboards for a realtor named Chris Lindahl. He has his arms akimbo the entire width of that billboard and with the smirkiest grin on his face. And I dislike it every time I drive by it or see it. Uh, it's very unfortunate and seems very fake. I have a friend who's also a realtor. His name is Nate Pence, and he is one of the most legit guys I know. He's not going to try to sell you something you don't want. This isn't a plug for Nate Pence unless you want it to be, but he he's just real. I worked with him, and he uh, it's like, hey, what do you want? I'm not going to try to push this on you, and that meant a lot to me, and it's why I've even, I guess, name-dropped him here. But the second thing uh, is that when someone pretends that their product uh, is more significant than it is. That's a major turnoff to me. No, it's not a lifestyle, Jeff. It's a cough drop. Darn it. <laughs> Darn if it doesn't taste like a blown out tire, but it works, right? I think <laughs> what I mean by that, I was listening to a car commercial way back in the day when I was driving and someone called into like a helpline and they're like, hey, this cough drop or this cough or whatever it is, tastes like garbage. And they're like, well, are you still coughing? No, not still coughing. It's like, well, then it worked. Uh, but man, so many times you'll hear it's not this. It's a it's a lifestyle, right? It's not a lifestyle. Sometimes it's just a cough drop. But people listen when they believe you're real, and you personally believe what you're sharing. Uh, that comes across. So I'll try not to go to extremes. Showing some emotion can actually be a very helpful tool if it's honest. Uh, I'm not an emotional guy. And even welling up brings about embarrassment for me <laughs> due to some uh, bullying when I was younger. But that only arises for me when I really care about something. And it's had great uh, effects in the past. What I mean by that as well, what, during Toastmasters, there are some times where I've felt embarrassed uh, because I'm talking about something I really care about. Uh, my eyes are welling up. It's hard to see. It's hard to talk at those points. Uh, but people know that I care, that authenticity comes across. And so if you feel like uh, what you're going to talk about is a difficult thing to talk about, it can, again, be helpful to practice to get some of that experience in uh, trying to talk through that. Uh, but if you get a little choked up, if you get a little emotional, sometimes if you get excited about it, that can still come across and work to your benefit. Uh, so don't be afraid of that. Um, and one more uh, note about authenticity here. Uh, in the disability community, uh, there's a topic that's gaining traction uh, for what's called like basic language explanations uh, of texts. Uh, so there are some publications that have even come out recently describing things about disability with uh, an appendix or uh, another like published piece alongside that uh, with just basic language. Uh, because even though it's often thought that you'll impress someone and you'll gain credibility if you use a lot of jargon and industry terms, and while sometimes those are necessary, uh, two major skills I've actually learned from Toastmasters were the importance of distilling larger ideas into simpler, relatable language, uh, and the importance of parameters and editing. As I mentioned earlier, I've worked at a university for nine years now. And the saying is true, you wanna work smarter, not harder. Uh, just because you wrote a 30 page paper uh, when you've been asked for eight to 10 pages doesn't actually make you sound smarter, it just makes it look like you haven't read the directions. Uh, and it also uh, might make your instructor a little bit upset that they had to read so much. And even, you know, that's to say, even if they did, I actually knew some instructors who would stop at whatever the page limit said and grade it from there. They're not gonna waste their time reading more. So. If you're able to gather yourself to understand the material and to distill it into something that's simple, that's brief, uh, that can go a long way. And so, uh, you know, let's make sure I'm clear. So Matt, uh, if you're saying I'm confident and I know my stuff and I bring a solid plan forward and then sure that I'm being authentic the whole way through, then it'll all work out. I'll get my proposal over the line. We'll get all the funding we need. 
definitely. Yep. hundred percent of the time without question. That is exactly what I'm saying. <laughs> uh, or not, you know, uh, here are a couple more anecdotes, uh, you know, for some times that I've worked, uh, authentically I've worked hard and, uh, maybe it's worked out or still hasn't in this case, I got a slide up here. that says, be my Valentine, uh, in three days. <laughs> uh, this is referencing when I was in eighth grade. Uh, my voice had newly changed. I'd come off of being the poster child for United Way of Candy, Ojai County, and uh, got to miss, miss a bunch of school trying to do some fundraising. But unfortunately, this had a strange adverse effect, leading of uh, the chair of the Chamber of Commerce to come sing to me with her women's quartet on Valentine's Day in front of the class. Uh, and not hiding anything about it. Of course, there were people in the hall coming out to stay, stare and see what the heck was going on. Uh, as you can imagine, again, in eighth grade, being in front of the class, being sung to, not necessarily the uh, greatest thing you want to see, but I got some chocolates out of it. And I thought, hey, maybe I could turn this around into something to my benefit. I'd asked a gal to be my Valentine. And then she said, yes. Um, Three days later, uh, <laughs> I didn't get a response. We were in class. We together, we were passing in the hallways, no response. But three days later, she said, yes, I'll be your Valentine or be your girlfriend. Uh, and that lasted for about a whole week or two when we broke up. So it seemed like I was persuasive enough. I was going to give myself credit for it. Great. This worked out, <sighs> but apparently not. And some projects are like that as well. We're on track with something that we've requested and it falls apart. It could be for any number of reasons, but honestly, that's life. Uh, and sometimes we need to pick up and move on. Sometimes with those pieces that have been broken, we can create something even better. We've learned from it and we can know uh, how to factor that in, which goes into this last one here of where's the button? I say, seriously. Is that sometimes it works out, even if it takes a little longer than we like. Uh, as mentioned earlier, I have spina bifida uh, as a disabled guy. So that means I have some limited mobility uh, and it's evolved over time. But in 2017, I started using a wheelchair. And as part of my job, I would have one-on-ones with my supervisor. And sometimes we would just go walk through the skyways. And for those who are not in Minnesota and unfamiliar with the skyways, basically we created uh, tunnels above the roads so that we didn't have to go into the cold and could still get from building to building if they were close enough and especially when it was cold enough, which is about half the year here. So uh, we were going to the skyways, but before we even got out of the building, uh, we approached the elevator bay and my supervisor, Tara, said, hey, where's the button as she's looking and fumbling around? because we've gotten so used to having access buttons, right? To hit and the door automatically opens, but we didn't have those. Uh, sometimes we're in a unique situation where we recognize a need that other people may not see. Uh, up until this point, I thought that this access issue was just my problem and mine alone, uh, maybe a couple other people. Uh, but she helped me to mobilize other coworkers and departments. Uh, some were uh, of these allies were dealing with access issues themselves or mobility issues uh, or had for even short times in their lives uh, due to maybe breaking an ankle. Uh, that was the case for one of my uh, greatest allies who became a, and it still is a great friend. Um, but others were just appalled, <laughs> like on my behalf. They'd see me struggling with these heavy doors in the elevator bays. Uh, and that's, you know, even before I came back with lunch in my hands and they were trying to help out. Uh, long story short here, we got it done. We got the buttons installed. Uh, I say long story short because it was long. It took a while. Uh, it took many months actually, even to get them convinced because the departments wanted to pass uh, the responsibility onto another one and not to another one and not to another one. Uh, but we got it done, kind of. We got the buttons in that elevator bay. Uh, but we did have to do that again later when our disability services office got moved uh, just outside of the inaccessible elevator bay that uh, we had uh, while I was working on the team using my wheelchair. But this time I had experience, uh, and so did they. 
the uh, the company, the university, uh, they knew how to work this. They knew who to rope in, whose responsibility it was. Uh, so we all learned together. And not only did we get new buttons in the bays, but also for the bathrooms nearby. Uh, it sounds like a corny success, but let me tell you, uh, trying to get into some of those doors while navigating a wheelchair, hand to full bladder, it's not always easy. So uh, I just thought I'd share some of that for you. <laughs> uh, this next slide and final slide here, essentially, I have uh, titled stick to itiveness. And you may not get a yes on the first go around for any number of reasons. It could be timing, budgeting, prioritization, uh, but get the message out to different leaders. Maybe try different approaches, stay persistent, and perhaps the overlap will get through after multiple attempts. Uh, a little seed in this person's ear, a little bit here and there. And when they get together, like, oh yeah, I feel like I heard somebody talking about that. Maybe we should actually pay attention. Maybe we should uh, get this funding set up. Maybe we should uh, get these people connected. I think sometimes that's uh, even just one of the, the great advantages of being able to present these things and to try to be persuasive to people. Uh, if possible, you know, find out the reasons if there's a denial and see if that message can be altered at all. See if there's something that could be changed. Uh, but most importantly, be patient and be kind, and especially to yourself. Uh, it's extremely difficult to keep that motivation when hearing uh, no's or not yet, but persistence can be very powerful in the long run. Uh, maybe something changes personally for the decision maker between when they heard it the first time and this most recent time. Uh, for instance, hypothetically, when you went uh, to a romantic movie with someone, such as once, let's just say the movie was once, uh, and this person was actively avoiding dating you because the last time these same friends tried to hook them up with someone, uh, that guy ended up being a total goon. I mean, maybe you're not a goon. Anyway, again, hypothetically, okay. So you're totally rooting against the couple in the movie getting together uh, the first time, right? But the second time you went to see that romantic movie, the same individual, they'd actually seen that their resistance was petty <laughs> maybe they were more open to seeing your side of how love can transform in unexpected <laughs> ways as expressed through song hypothetically <laughs> all right well thanks for listening <laughs> everyone here uh and yeah i'll just open this up to any questions y'all might have i know i covered a lot uh but i'd love to uh, connect you can use the chat the q a and i believe matt will be doing the moderation of that definitely oh, thanks Matt. Here. You bet. all right um the first question we have here is from bernadette it says uh how do you engage with audiences who don't care because it doesn't affect them Whew. yeah you know i feel like it's mostly my life right um and i think frequently it's making the case uh that it doesn't affect you now. Um, uh, in my case, with a lot of disability advocacy work uh, and other pieces there, it's letting them know, hey, well, you may not be disabled right now, having you know, a long enough timeline, you might have some effects there on your mobility, on your health, uh, or know someone close to you who does. I'm like, that's not a threat. It's just actively like <laughs> addressing what's a real issue. And so uh, when you're talking to people who are like, this doesn't affect me, sometimes it is just pre presenting the stories, presenting anecdotes for how it's affected you, how it's affected other people you've known. Um, and while data can sometimes be helpful, sometimes it has a weird adverse effect where people, they don't wanna hear the numbers and push back or the numbers seem relatively low, but let's say uh, again, and I apologize for using this <laughs> framework frequently, uh, but something like curb cuts in accessibility, right? Those were designed for people with wheelchairs. Uh, but I was actually at a presentation once where someone said, oh, you mean those things so we can like bring our luggage up the curbs? It's like, sure. Yeah, that's why that was design or design, <laughs> you know, like universal design, uh, intentional design around uh, or inclusive design. These things tend to have uh, effects for other people too, right? So even if it's not something like, access and accessibility, maybe it is getting a, a group together on campus, uh, that can help other people realize that, oh, this can be done. 
uh, it gives them permission like for themselves to realize that, uh, yeah, we can uh, care about this or maybe we should be looking outside of ourselves and actually listening to people instead of just uh, what we've been personally experiencing. Apologize if that was ranty <laughs> going on, but hopefully that answer them. Thanks, Matt. Um, Nikki doesn't have a question, but she just wanted to thank you for being vulnerable and providing relevant information. You bet. And thank then, you so much. <laughs> an anonymous attendee um, says, you mentioned authenticity, but in the world of drug and alcohol addiction and mental health issues too, where there is a lot of stigma and shame, where do you stand on self-disclosure? Something to embrace, be cautious about, situation specific, uh, et cetera say yes <laughs> i know it's it's like yes in all those cases and i think it is really individual uh, and specific to the situation uh, there are times when i'll just say this pandemic has been weird for me because right now from what you see in this box i may not look uh disabled maybe i do maybe picking up on some cues here but like i've actually had to self-disclose uh for the first time in my life it's normally been very perceptive <laughs> by anyone who sees me in a few seconds uh, as determined by a lot of the stairs. Um, and so with disabilities, with invisible disabilities, with uh, chemical dependency challenges, with mental health, like these are things that carry a lot of weight to them, uh, sometimes stigma. Uh, but if we don't say anything, and if we continue to like keep quiet about this, then uh, it will just remain in the dark. Right. I think it's, again, easier said than done and choose your battles. There are some people that I will not disclose to. It doesn't make sense to or I'll disclose certain parts of what I've been experiencing. Uh, but that's kind of testing the waters a little bit. And sometimes, I mean, I'll be honest, kind of like making people feel uncomfortable <laughs> at points and uh, just relishing in that awkwardness. Uh, but again, that's not all the time. And I don't always have the energy for it. Sometimes I just don't engage and I move on. But I think having that uh, that authenticity, that realness to you, that's able to uh, claim it, not even just in the good times, right? Not like, hey, I'm in recovery and I'm, you know, two years uh, clean, sober, whatever it might be. It's just, uh, it could be like, man, I, I thought I was doing well. I'm having a hard time. Uh, can we talk about this? And a lot of people just want to be asked at times and other people may not have the capacity to address that with you. And so I think it's, uh, man, again, this is a, a huge <laughs> thing to unpack, uh, but I think we're, uh, you know, even as part of this crew in a good space to be able to discuss that, right? Like when uh, does it feel comfortable disclosing? What are the, the risks, the challenges, what's gonna go along with that? Uh, and sometimes there's finding some safe partners to work with in uh, gaining some experience with that. Nice, safe partners. I get it. <laughs> yeah. Um, we've got one here. It says, um, when is it okay to go over somebody's head? Should you start at the bottom and move up? Or if you don't get the answer you want, do you move on? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, so I, uh, from experience, have at times gone towards the top. Uh, but if you do that, I think it is careful to try to not burn bridges. If you're going higher, uh, a good thing to keep in mind be maybe do that first <laughs> before receiving a no. If you receive a no uh, right off the bat, and especially if you jump without having any kind of confrontation or having any discussion about that, then it can really come across as, oh, you're going over my head, you don't respect me, and you've essentially burned a bridge. Um, when uh, there have been times though, where uh, I will talk to someone, I'll get a no, uh, I'll try to understand their reasoning for it. And I'll just be explicit with them. Like, okay, I'm gonna, like, I understand what you're saying. I'm gonna see if there's a different avenue or something that I can do to address that and call it out. So it's not about that person and seeing that person as a barrier, but seeing that they are with what they're given at that moment, may be required to say no uh, or to not allow for those things. So uh, I try to be explicit about it because I do feel like that authenticity and that openness can be helpful. Um, 
but yeah, some people are petty. <laughs> They're just going to be that way. Some people are not going to want to hear it and not appreciate that you talk to somebody else about it. Uh, but I think kind of weigh it. Right? And sometimes it is talking with peers about that and uh, seeing what that <laughs> could mean for you, even from experience. But yeah. Right. Uh, here's an interesting one. Uh, mm -hmm. It's about written communication. What about emails? I've been told I come across with strong opinions in my emails. Yeah. Is it better to go in person? Oh, man. Uh, it depends, right? And I think I hate using that and falling back on it because I feel like they're like, oh, that's a cop-out answer. But uh, it, it, email has the benefit of allowing time and uh, specificity of language, right? What's been helpful for me sometimes in emails is if that's how I have to interact, because sometimes that is the case, uh, but people are able to interpret your tone however they want, right? <laughs> it could be they read it Monday morning and that's gonna read very differently than Thursday midday. So sometimes picking the timing, sometimes picking uh, the wording, sometimes just taking a step away. I've had great benefit from writing up an email, coming back to it an hour later and <laughs> reading it again when maybe I'm a little less heated. Maybe I've had some time to cool down uh, or I'm just in a better mood because I had a great lunch, right? And so I can look at that and say, hey, uh, how, how would this read to someone else? So I think even trying to take that other perspective can be helpful. Uh, and again, if you have a close peer or friend who's willing to read that before you send it, I don't know how many times I've had my coworkers check some of those emails. So I'm like, I'm feeling a little sassy today. Is this coming across? Uh, how how <laughs> can I be more diplomatic in my uh, writing of this? Uh, because it can depend. Um, for me, it's been helpful to have phone calls, uh, to have Zoom meetings, to be in person when possible uh, to discuss these things. And I'll be honest, for me, especially if I'm rolling up in my wheelchair and talking about access, it's a lot harder to say no to someone when you're right in their face than if it's like through an email uh, or there's that immediate uh, requirement of having to respond rather than finding whatever, whatever loopholes might be <laughs> available to say it's like, well, talk to me as a person. We're not just talking policy here. We're talking me. I have needs. This is what I need to do or just what I need to survive, <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Um, here's another one from Anonymous. Uh, mm -hmm. Literally going to a first job interview after this, mm -hmm. how do you balance showing your knowledge base without appearing egotistical and also with being self-effacing? Basically confidence with, without God complex. Hopefully yeah. that makes sense. Oh, absolutely. I've been in that space too. Uh, even sometimes you see the pendulum swing, right? Like I've been super quiet at points and they're like, oh, you should be confident, you should do that. And then it can come across as cocky, right? Or uh, in that space of like, ha ha ha, I know so much. But uh, that confidence, it goes a long way. And I think when you're just being your authentic self and you're talking about that, some people, again, are going to receive that however they're going to receive it. And we're not responsible for that. But I think we can be authentic. Like, should I have said, oh, I'm actually a great communicator? Uh, or like, hey, you should, uh, I don't know, hire me for this job. Why? Because I actually have all the skills that are required for this. You say in your job description that you're wanting this, this is where my skills line up with that. You could maybe find someone who has some of these other ones uh, or a component of here or there, but you don't have to compromise with me. I actually have, uh, I meet all the qualifications and more, and this is what I would contribute to that. And I think when you can have that confidence in it, again, which is difficult at times to gain that, <laughs> to feel comfortable doing it, uh, but maybe practice in a mirror, record yourself, see how it comes across to you if you were sitting and being uh, on the other side of the table. Uh, because yeah, it can be, can be a challenge to talk ourselves up. Uh, and I don't know uh, where this person's coming from, but especially in Midwest culture, it's not always uh, looked highly upon <laughs> to like talk yourself up uh, and to just be so modest uh, as much as possible to the point where you're like, okay, you can knock it off and actually take some credit for something. Uh, so yeah, I'd say uh, own the stuff that you do that you know. And uh, yeah. 
good luck in the interview. <laughs> Best wishes with that. That's that's exciting. I wanted to ask a quick question um, because I think there's a parallel um, between some of the work that you're doing and some of the, the work that our students are doing. Um, I know you and I had talked about legal challenges and when oh, yeah. the law is on your side, when do you, whip, obviously you don't want to go into a meeting and say, actually, you have to do this. You yeah. want to inspire and convince folks to come to your side, but when they actually do have to do this, uh, how do you weigh when to play that card or if to play that card? Uh, that's a great question. If there's resistance. Um, uh, so yeah, uh, sorry, I'll start back where you were saying. It's not the first thing I <laughs> pull out. It's not the first car that's like, bam, legal, let's go. Uh, however, uh, let's say even with the instance of uh, getting those buttons in, right? There, there, one of the arguments made when I was making that original proposal was that, oh, we have a security officer and a phone in each of the elevator bays so that if you don't have access to this and you have difficulty opening the door, you can reach for the phone that's five feet up and when you're sitting in a wheelchair, not super easy to grab, uh, and call this one security guard to come let you in to whatever floor. And I was like, do you know how many times we have meetings on other floors? How many times I have to move through this? This is not equal access, right? And so for the longest time was just trying to appeal to decency to reason <laughs> these different things. But at one point did have to even just say, the I have to assume that the installation of these buttons is going to be cheaper than a potential lawsuit uh, or like legal action taken on this. And it's not even necessarily that I would do it. Like I like where I work, I'm looking out for this place. I have my needs, but also someone who's even just coming in here without any, uh, skin in the game i don't know if that's a terrible thing to say maybe but like they've come in for an interview and don't have access they could make the case that denial of their opportunity for employment was due to the potential of having to add uh, accessibility features right uh, rarely will anyone ever explicitly say that <laughs> like no i'm not gonna do this for you because it costs too much money but uh, there's that subtext and especially with someone who isn't working there, they don't have much to lose, could bring a case to it. And I think once they started hearing some of that, they were a little more <laughs> amenable to uh, making some changes. And so, yeah, I wouldn't say it's a, a first go-to, but I think when there are implications, understanding that this is also potentially helping them, right? And try not to be smarmy about it. <laughs> and like, oh yeah, well, you could get a, a, I could get some money from you. It's like, well, first off, probably not going to happen but yeah <laughs> uh, hopefully that helps right it's not not a uh, an immediate go-to but i think after a few confrontations if there's still that resistance it may not hurt to bring up some hypotheticals <laughs> yeah um we've got one more here one last sure. one um nikki says at the beginning of the meeting you talked about the different types of persuasion May you please elaborate on how you balance and know when to switch your approach from convince to call to action approaches. Yeah, I think it's honestly just trying to figure out what your aim is, right? The end understanding your audience. Is the audience that you're going to be talking to already on your side? Are you trying to make some incremental change of just informing them and helping them to understand or do you want something from them, right? And I think when we know, hopefully what you're wanting from it is can help determine the approach that you take uh yeah i'll leave it at that <laughs> otherwise i could get go on for another five minutes and don't think we got time for that <laughs> know your ask yep awesome well we are at the top of the hour and i want to respect everybody's time today so thanks so much matt for joining us i know that this is an incredibly important topic because all of our crla students are actually doing exactly what we spoke about today. They're going um, to campus administrators and people who do have that decision-making power to help uh, advocate for some of the changes that they wanna see. So I know that a lot of the information awesome. shared today is gonna be really helpful. Just some housekeeping items. I am gonna be sharing a survey right now in the chat box so you can all 
please take that. Um, we really want to be able to improve our webinars as time progresses. So please take a minute to just fill that out. Additionally, you're going to be receiving a follow up email that's going to include some additional information about Safe Project and this Collegiate Recovery Leadership Academy program. If you're not familiar with either, we would really encourage you to take a look at the website and just learn more about the programming that we offer. And also, we'll just send out a recording to this webinar as well, so you can send it on to your colleagues or anybody who might be interested. Thanks again for joining us, Matt. You bet. Thank you so much.